Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. Happy Tuesday to you. Although it's a bit of a sad day for us here. Uh, no Uncle Jimmy today. Uncle Jimmy, uh, Corey has told me uh, one of the blue M&Ms has filed a paternity suit against uh, Uncle Jimmy, and he's in court today uh, fighting that paternity uh, suit. Uh, so we'll update you as we, I think we're going to get live updates uh, throughout the show on how that paternity suit is going. I'm just kidding. Uncle Jimmy feeling a l slightly under the weather. And so you just got me today and our main man, the smartest man on the show, Professor Delano Squires. Professor D is going to join us from Washington, D.C. after I start this fire. And I got to tell you something. Maybe it's because Uncle Jimmy's not here, but I got the greatest fire that I'm ever going to start on this show. I don't know if I can top what I'm about to do, but, you know, I'll try. All right, so let's get it started. If an accurate history is ever written, we will remember this time of racial upheaval as an aftershock of the 1849 California gold rush. Let me explain. Gold is not scarce. Its high value is derived from the difficulty in finding it and the costly production process to produce the metal. Racial bias, it's not scarce. We all produce it. Progress and enlightenment have helped us combat and conceal our biases, making racism far more difficult to find and even harder to produce the systemic racism that once plagued our laws and American customs. Racism is now a form of gold, a high value, precious element desperately hunted by race miners sometimes called race baiters. The discovery of racism greatly enriches the miner. Black Lives Matter founder Patrice Cullors turned Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and other dead black men into a pot of gold that allowed her to purchase four luxury homes across America. Sean King, the internet social activist known as Martin Luther Cream, tricked Oprah Winfrey into paying for him to attend a historically black university and has spent the past decade raising millions of dollars as a racism speculator. Lawyer Ben Crump is arguably America's richest race miner. He negotiated multi-million dollar settlements for the family of St. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many other families whose relatives have been killed while resisting arrest. Yesterday, Crump celebrated the fact that Minnesota real estate listings won't be using the phrase master bedroom because it painfully reminds black people of slavery. I'm not joking. Crump tweeted verbatim, words matter. Good to see Minnesota phasing out the use of master bedroom in real estate listings. Many associated with slavery, a repetitive reminder of plantation life. Together, we can create more inclusive, aware communities. You know what? I wanna read that again. I forgot, go back, I wanna read that again. I want to, I, I forgot, I wanted to do this in Ben Crump's voice, if I can. I don't know if I can. Words don't matter. Good to see Minnesota so debated out the use of the master bedroom in real estate listings. Many associated with Slavery, a repetitive reminder of plantation life. Together, we can create more inclusive, aware communities. That's Ben Crump. The allure of mining for racism is that it requires no intelligence or integrity. An idiot can do it and make a fortune. Crump is exhibit A. But it's not just individuals who pan for racism. Major corporations prospect for it too. On Sunday, the Colorado Rockies released a statement accusing one of their fans of shouting the N-word at a Florida Marlins player standing in the batter's box. Let me read from the Rockies statement. The Colorado Rockies are disgusted at the racial slur by a fan directed at the Marlins' Lewis Brinson during the ninth inning of today's game. Although the subject was not identified prior to the end of the game, the Rockies are still investigating this incident. 
The Rockies have zero tolerance for any form of racism or discrimination, and any fan using derogatory language of any kind will be ejected and banned from Coors Field. Problem is, turns out the fan was shouting for the attention of Colorado's mascot, whose name is Dinger. There's video and audio proof of the accused fan waving at and shouting toward Dinger. Take a listen. Brinson never heard, that's the baseball player that was standing in the batter's box, he never heard or reacted to the alleged racial slur. The Rockies issued a new statement on Monday admitting the fan did nothing wrong. As of Monday evening, the Rockies had not issued an apology to the fan. We are living in the American racism rush. Citizens turned prospectors are getting rich mining for racism. It is analogous and connected to the California gold rush. In January of 1848, a sawmill operator, James Marshall, discovered gold 35 miles east of Sacramento. Marshall's discovery ignited a gold rush and a transformational migration to the Golden State. In 1849, approximately 90,000 men descended on Northern California in search of their riches. The migration turned California from an ignored, sleepy territory to a boom state almost overnight. Two years after Marshall's discovery, California was admitted into the Union. The 49ers, the nickname for the men who rushed to California, were lawless, greedy, and uncivilized. They overwhelmed Native Americans, running the indigenous people out of their hunting and fishing grounds. The Indians starved or they were massacred by the guns used by the 49ers. The influx of men seeking gold created another California complication, a shortage of women. Boatloads of men docked in the Bay Area and settled in San Francisco. With few women in town, cross-dressing and gay sex became quite popular in San Francisco. Greed and sexual deviancy began their rulership of Northern California 170 years ago. The people who acquired the most wealth and power during the gold rush weren't the miners. The men who built businesses to exploit the miners amassed generational wealth. A man named Sam Branham became California's first millionaire. At an exorbitant markup, he sold prospectors the equipment they needed to mine gold. Levi Strauss moved to San Francisco to sell dry goods to miners and later sold them work pants and overalls and blue jeans. George Hearst, the father of publishing kingpin, William Randolph Hearst, he got rich during the gold rush. Twitter's Jack Dorsey and Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg are the modern day Sam Branham and Levi Strauss. The Silicon Valley tech titans own the platforms that promote, traffic, and sell racism gold. They've become powerful millionaires because of the American racism rush. Their platforms celebrate, advocate for, and spread the values established in Northern California in 1849. We, those of us who believe in God, traditional values, and this country's founding documents, we, are the indigenous people being starved, pushed aside, and massacred. The San Francisco 49ers rule America. Now that's a fire. That, my friends, is my best work I've done here at The Blaze. We're gonna go out to uh, Washington, D.C., bring in my guy, Delano, Squires to talk about this, and he's written a terrific column. But first, I want to tell you about my good friends at Built Bar. Nothing calms me down better than a good Built Bar. You know what, Corey? Could you toss me one now, please? I could use one. I'm a little, after that fire I just started, I'm a little verklempt. Or, I don't know, I'm a little hungry. Whatever that means. All right, we got those new Rocky Road flavor bars last week, and I've been killing them. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been on a diet. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I've been losing a little weight. These built Bars have helped. 
They taste great. They're so much better than anything you've tasted from a low calorie uh, replacement meal bar. Built Bars keep me going during my day. The hardest thing I deal with is figuring out which flavor to go to next. Go to built.com and use promo code FEARLESS to save 15% off your first order. Use promo code FEARLESS for 15% off at built.com. Okay, let's roll out to Washington, D.C. and bring in my guy, Delano Squires, who's also written a terrific column that we'll get to. He wrote it yesterday about the Washington Post story about lynching, but we're going to begin today's uh, conversation with Delano about the fire I just started. I want to get his reaction. Delano's a smart man. Delano, uh, welcome to the show. And I want to know what you think about uh, my mono. Thanks for having me, Jason. Um, it was really interesting. Um, it was part history lesson. Uh, I, I didn't know a lot about the 49ers. I just knew the basics of the gold rush. I didn't know um, about their treatment towards Native Americans. I didn't know about you know, some of the gender practices. I didn't know about some of the businessmen who got rich off the gold rush. But um, I definitely see the parallels to what we're going through right now. I mean, even I, I commented on the, the Ben Crump tweet yesterday, and really he epitomizes what the, the, the issue that we're dealing with right now, which is when the demand for gold um, outpaces the supply, eventually miners will just start turning to fool's gold, and they will make up instances of, of racial discrimination. Uh, racial discrimination. Um, they'll overblow, you know, relatively minor um, disagreements between, you know, black folks and white folks, um, or they'll just, you know, glom onto hoaxes and, and ride them until the steam lets out, whether that's Jesse Smollett or, or some other hoax, and they, they make off with their goods and, and, and their payday. And then, you know, the rest of us are left, you know, having to clean it up. So it, it was a really interesting monologue. I, I was wondering where you were going when you talked about the San Francisco 49ers. I thought it was a sports reference, um, but I, I, I see where you were going with that. You thought it was a reference to what? I, I thought it was a sports reference. I thought it was a, a reference to the team, the San Francisco 49ers. Oh, oh. Um, it, it is a sports reference. It has a double okay. meaning in terms of I've walked you through the history of where the 49ers nickname came from. And it came from the people in 1849 who massacred, slaughtered, ran off Native Americans. And it's now the nickname for the San Francisco 49ers football team. And, mm. and one of the, I'm glad you picked up on it because you live in Washington, D.C. The Washington Redskins had to change their name because they went with a mascot that in their view celebrated Native Americans. The mm -hmm. 49ers have a nickname that basically celebrates the slaughter, the disenfranchisement of Native Americans, but we're all good with it. And, and so I just want, again, the, the, I want people to understand who the 49ers were and, and, and one of the things I really, because I did, I loved this column and I was excited when I came up with the concept and the execution of it. But, but Delano, and, and this relates to the piece you wrote uh, yesterday that I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I do want to just, we're not, the conversations aren't being framed properly by the mm -hmm. American media. And w no one is trying, is explaining to the American public hey, here's what's going on in our culture. There's things that actually did happen 170 years ago that have gone unaddressed. Oh, because look, slavery went addressed. Jim Crow got addressed. The things that happened with the 49ers in California 170 years ago, never addressed, just baked into America. And so it's not a coincidence that 90,000, 100,000, eventually 300,000, mostly men, like 98% of the people that went to California and searching for gold were men. And we wonder why there is sexual deviance, and I looked up the word deviance to make sure that was the proper word, 
outside mm. the norm. That's not me casting uh, a negative opinion on it. Outside the norm. Why outside the norm sexual behavior seems so clustered in San Francisco, in Northern California, and now those values, the greed, the corruption, the, the, the pillaging and the plunder and the slaughtering of free speech, all of that stuff we saw that went on with the California gold rush is now going on across America to the very people. We are the indigenous people of America, the new ones. And again, I know the Native Americans were here first. But those of us who believe in God, those of us that believe in traditional values, those of us that believe in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, we're getting slaughtered by the new 49ers. They're running, they're running us out of control of America and they're imposing Northern California, San Francisco values that were started mm. in 1849 when 300,000 men went to California and left their wives and girlfriends behind. Mm. So, so one thing that made me think about is it, it'll be interesting in generations to come when somebody does some investigative reporting to figure out what types of cultural practices are at play right now among the, the new 49ers, right? The, the big tech firms, um, the big corporations. Um, um, maybe somebody will do it at some point, uh, but it would be interesting to know what, type, what types of things that they do uh, in, in their private lives, because we definitely see what they do in, in their public life. As you said, they're all for squelching free speech. Um, they say that they, they are um, part of what makes democracy run, but you don't really have a democracy if you can't have dissenting opinions. And, and if your opinions don't line up with you know, the cultural tastemakers, then we, we see where that goes. Uh, there, there's actually um, one, of the, you know, one of the fellow uh, Blaze family members, Ali Bastucki, was suspended from Twitter the other day for noting that the Olympian, I can't remember the person's name, but the, the transgender Olympian who was allowed to compete in weightlifting is actually a male. Um, Ali Bestucki made that comment and said, this person is a male and we should not call this person a she, this person is a he because the pronoun belongs to the sex and this person is a male and Twitter banned her for a period of time. Um, and a couple other people were banned for doing the same thing. So you can see, as you said, all, all these things playing out even in, in real time where, and I like the way you put it, where San Francisco, Silicon Valley values and culture are being imposed on, on the rest of America. Um, and as it relates to race, as I said, they, they are very good at enabling the race miners um, to mine for gold. Um, you, if you log on to Twitter on any given day, you'll see three or four Karen videos, quote unquote Karen videos, where, you know, as I said, a, a white person, a black person get into some minor disagreement and it blows up and it takes over the internet and all of a sudden, it's a referendum on, on America and, and America being racist. And um, those things are enabled by people. Um, you, you never see the same type of uh, fury or, or uh, emphasis put on some of the incidents that happen, you know, in other communities and, in, in, you know, low income black communities where, you know, kids and innocent bystanders are, are you know, basically living in neighborhoods where, where shootings and homicides are, are pretty common, you never see the same people using the tech tools, the, the you know, Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram um, to find out who the shooters are. But anytime there's a person, whether it's Amy Cooper or anyone else, right, who gets into some minor disagreement with a black person in public, everybody knows that person's name by lunchtime. And oftentimes those people are f forced to leave their homes and get fired from their jobs. So it's, as I said, there's a lot of fool's gold out there. And I'm really concerned because when it comes to the black community, we, um, in, in some respects, we take the gold that the miners find and that the, 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 the tech titans help process and we lay it on our neck, end up claiming some level of victimhood and then when we take it off, we realize all we're left with is those strange green marks that you get from wearing cheap jewelry. 
and, and I'd like us to get out of that business and cast and toss that, that gold exactly that gold exactly where it needs to be, which is right in the trash. Delano, hell of an analogy. Awesome job. I want to stick with or I want to go to Ben Crump because I actually saw his master bedroom tweet when you retweeted it and posted a comment. And, and I'm looking at, and, and your take was correct. If these are our civil rights leaders and this is what they're worrying about, making sure real estate listings in Minnesota don't use the word master bedroom, somehow this is progress. And, and the point I made in, in my column today, and, and again, you don't have to agree with it, but I, I kind of do want you to comment. I don't think Ben Crump is very smart. I don't think he has command of the English language. I don't think he's he's certainly not MLK in terms of oratory skills. Uh, he comes off to me as an idiot. But this panning mining for racism is so easy that even someone who's not that smart can make a fortune off of it. And he has made a fortune helping settle these lawsuits between families that, that had their relatives killed by police. I, I just, is master bedrooms, is that really our problem? Is, is that really, is that really progress? The fact that we, what, are there no master chefs anymore? Because, you know, mm. I can't eat from a master chef now. I, I, I don't, can I use my master card? Can mm. I can I whip that out uh, <laughs> and pay for anything? I, I it's mind blowing how dumbed down the conversation is about race, and 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 how the system, Silicon Valley, the the tech system props up Crump, Sean King, and anybody else willing to to sell fool's gold to black people. Yeah. So I'll say this. I'll say two things. Um, one, in some respects, this is actually a, a positive occurrence. And I say that because if we were truly living in a country that was as systemically racist as, as people like Ben Crump and Al Sharpton and Sean King claim, there would be no need to go after fool's gold. We would see um, op, op, we would have opportunities every day to discuss you know, real issues of systemic racism. If, if, you know, black or Hispanic people actually couldn't vote because of their skin color, or they couldn't live in certain neighborhoods because of their skin color, um, those people would have, people like Ben Crump would have a lot of, a lot to do, right? The NAACP and his legal defense fund would have a lot to do. And, and I'm sure they'll say that they are doing a lot. But the fact that things have gotten so good in our country that somebody, as you said, like Benjamin Crump, can can tweet about things like this, and at one point, in one part of the tweet, I think it was all caps. I think he said words matter, and to me, that that's a sign of progress. Um, now, on on that's a sign of progress in to, in the country. Now, as it relates to people like him, and in my tweet, I, I referred to them as a talented tenth. I think what you see is. Um, sort of the, that group, the black elite, drawing their last breath of relevance. Um, they are having a hard time staying relevant in today's society because in many respects, they got exactly what uh, they and their, their sort of cultural ancestors were asking for, right? We're freer, more prosperous, um, certainly, you know, most wealthy people of African descent on the face of the planet. But if all, if your entire career and your, your livelihood is found, is built around finding racism, um, as incidents of racism start to recede and, de and decrease, you just have to go further and further out to find them or make them up or try to frame things as racist. So, you know, I, I, and I, I said it in my tweet, you know, if this is what the town to 10th is up to, then they just need to be put out the pasture. They're, they're a relic. It's it's like, you know, the four plant turning out Model T's. They're just, they're just they're no longer relevant in today's society. And that's why when when they speak, they always talk about things that have happened in the past. Right. Selma to them is a symbol. They never say what Selma, Alabama looks like today. No one knows, because when they say Selma, we think of a, a black and white photo of civil rights, you know, protesters marching over a bridge. Um, 
and we're in a we're in a, a place now in our country and in our world where we actually need um, clear thinkers who can speak about where we are today and where we are likely to be, you know, 50, 100, 200 years from now, not people who are still stuck, um, you know, trying to relitigate battles that have already been won. I, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, and, and maybe I am. And that, that's fine, because I'm going to keep saying it until people get it. I, I go all the way back to the 1965 Monaghan Report. Hmm. And what the Monaghan Report was about, in my view, was, okay, we just handed, by law, African Americans freedom. And the Monaghan Report is like, okay, now we need to uh, financially support and help them understand what to do with that freedom, how to be responsible with this freedom. And he wanted to invest in the black family. That was the most responsible thing you could do. The, if you want to maximize this freedom, invest more in the family. And, and so w what I'm looking at when I look at Ben Crump, when I look at uh, Al Sharpton, when I look at a lot of these talking heads on CNN and MSNBC, it's like they don't know what to do with the responsibility of freedom. And so they want to con continue to pretend like, well, there is no freedom. So I don't, even, I don't need to instruct black people on what to do now that you're free and how to maximize this freedom. I need to pretend like there's no freedom there's a job and a pay text and cultural relevance in that. Anybody that runs around and imitates MLK and pretends like it's still 1955, we're, the, the system's gonna put you on TV. There'll be 20 and 40 pieces of silver for you across Facebook and Twitter. And, and, but no one has seemed to want to, or those of us that do want to say, okay, we're free. Here's how we should handle things. Here's how we should do to maximize this. Let's diminish those people and uh, let's elevate the people that say, no, 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 no. White people are still in control. The master bedroom is only for them. You don't have that. Even though you got your own house, but that's really not your master bedroom. That's the white man's. He can come take it at any time. Again, there's a responsibility that goes with freedom and it seems like we don't want to tell black people that, or we don't trust black people to handle that responsibility. And I'm sorry, I just do. I came from nothing. My mother was a factory worker. My dad didn't graduate high school. In 1984, me and my dad were living in a one bedroom, 400 square foot apartment in the hood. He was teaching me responsibility then and planting seeds in me then that allowed me to live the life that I have. And it was always about self-responsibility. When he looked back at the mistakes he made, it was like, oh, I should have been more self-responsible then, or the IRS wouldn't have come after mm -hmm. me the way that he did. Anyway, I just think we need to be having a conversation with black people about the responsibility of freedom. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and I think I, I may have said it on, on a previous show, but when you build your identity around being oppressed, then the prospect of freedom will send you into an existential crisis because you'll ask yourself, if I'm not oppressed anymore, then who am I? And for, and for many of us, I'm not saying all, but for many of us, and this is across in, income and class spectrums, you're just as likely to find it, you know, in, in the hood as you are among, you know, the, the black folk who went to uh, Obama's 60th birthday party, they don't know who they are outside of feelings of being oppressed. Um, and that's why the, the leadership class, that's all that they, that they pump into our heads is no matter how much you make, no matter how much you have, no matter how educated you are, um, to white people, you're still an N-word. And you're, you, you are going to be oppressed because that's what America does to black people. Now, the people saying this are on cable television. You know, they love, live in multi-million dollar homes. Um, they have multiple homes across the country. They drive the nicest cars. They rarely come into contact with, you know, everyday people. They probably don't even buy their own groceries. 
But their consistent message is America is so racist that it keeps black people under their boot, except black people like me, because I found a way to make it. Now, they'll never say what that way is, um, but for them, they see their service as telling us, uh, you know, how much we're still in bondage. And, and really, in many respects, it's, it's actually quite cruel because they say that, you know, we're oppressed, we're victims, we're kept down, but they never say how they were able to rise. And it's almost like, you know, one beggar refusing to tell another where he found bread. And, and that's, that's how I see, you know, the black leadership class in many respects. Um, their only message is about continued systemic, systematic, endemic oppression, but they never tell people how it is that they were able to, to rise from that. Delano, we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about okay. your piece uh, about the Washington Post story. Uh, but before we go, I want to tell you about my good friends. I want to tell Delano about my good friends, uh, good ranchers. And, and Delano, I would, I would love to send you and your family some of this meat. Jimmy and I. Uh, Jimmy and his boys have been grilling it and cooking it and eating it. I've been grilling it, cooking it and eating it in my home. We're about to get a grill here at the studio. Good Ranchers is 1,000% American grass-fed beef, all developed and raised right here in America. It supports American farmers. The meat is absolutely excellent. They have chicken, seafood, any kind of steak you want, greatest steak burgers you'll ever eat. I'm telling you, lot. I need to hook you and your family up. You're going to love it. Uh, I love it. I sent some to my brother and his wife. They, they're going to love it. It hasn't gotten there yet. But if you subscribe, you will get $20 off and free express shipping. Get steakhouse quality for less than $5 per meal. Go to goodranchers.com slash fearless to get $20 off and free express shipping, that's goodranchers.com slash fearless. Welcome back. Jason Whitlock, Fearless. Uncle Jimmy's out today. Feel a little bit off, so he took the day off. But uh, we're continuing on with Delano Squires. Uh, we were talking about uh, the column I wrote today uh, and the monologue I delivered today about the... American racism gold rush, basically. And Delano wrote a piece yesterday that I felt had great synergy uh, with this. And, and, and I was talking to Delano uh, before the show. D Delano, does, I think a lot of people read his work and assume like, well, man, this guy's probably been a journalist for 15, 20 years. And it, <laughs> it's actually not true. And so Delano and I have a lot of interesting discussions where I'm trying to impart my 30 years of journalism knowledge onto Delano and to help him understand what's going on and why I wanted to work with him and why I'm enjoying working with him. And, and, and it has to do with both of my piece and Delano's piece connect together because what I'm trying to do with the, the monologue I did today and the piece I wrote today is trying to frame the discussion for mm -hmm. people and, and, and then have a discussion about the narrative that I frame. And that's where, for black people, uh, we've surrendered the ability to frame the discussion. Black newspapers are basically non-existent. Uh, the most talented black journalists, starting in the 60s and 70s, uh, migrated, integrated to the mainstream newspapers and media outlets. And we gave up control uh, when we did that. And it's difficult for us to frame a discussion. We get to be opinionists and talk about the journalism that others have done, and they get to frame the discussion. And so that's why D Delano says at the beginning, it's like, man, there's th that whole 49ers history and what impact it has on us today. I didn't realize any of that because for the, the mainstream corporate media is never going to point that out. Whoever the, the redheaded woman, the redheaded high priestess is at the uh, Ida Bay Wells at the New York Times, the editors at the New York Times would never sanction her to draw those conclusions and connect those dots. 
Now, they'll tell, hey, now you go do the 1619 project and, and you can connect these dots and you can make people talk about this. And we saw another example of that in the Washington Post that Delano wrote about yesterday. The Washington Post says, has a black female reporter, Deneen, I can't, Brown maybe, I can't remember her last name. Hey, go write about these eight suspected, suspected lynchings in Mississippi over the last 21 years. And we're gonna put a headline on it that says, lynchings have never stopped in Mississippi. And they've now framed a discussion like, now, now talk about this. The Washington Post, one of the most powerful media outlets in the country, Jeff Bezos's uh, public relations arm has said, now America, white people, black people, you talk about the eight lynchings in Mississippi like it's some sort of pandemic that black people should be living in fear of, but completely ignore, step over, the two, 300 dead bodies littered around Washington, D.C., and have this conversation about eight murders allegedly in Mississippi. But the two or 300 that will happen right here in D.C. this year, we're not going to talk about that. Anyway, Delano, I, I, I've rambled on enough. Ex explain your reaction to that story and, and what you wrote. So I asked myself the same question. Um, it wasn't just that it was eight suspected lynchings. It was eight suspected lynchings since 2000. So basically eight suspected lynchings in the last 21 years. And I was asking myself, what would possess the Post to run a national story about this? And really what it is, it comes down to is that this is a reflection on their priorities and the priorities of corporate media, generally speaking. And when I use that word, I want to be very specific. When I say priorities, I'm talking about um, the observed allocation of scarce resources. And there's no resource more scarce than time. So some people will give lip service. They'll say, well, we care about the, the shootings in big cities. And, you know, we care about what's happening to, to you know, black people in, in this place or the other place. But you never see them put any resources towards it. It's always these types of stories that are very short on new facts or new information, and this story was, and very long on history. So when, when I read it, it felt like a, at least two thirds of the story was, was them recounting the history of lynchings in the Deep South and, and Mississippi um, more specifically. And I'm not saying that that, that doesn't have value, um, but this is not, you know, the story wasn't written as a piece of history. The, the point of the story was to give the impression that nothing has changed in America in the last hundred years, and specifically nothing has changed for black men as it relates to lynchings and being under constant threat from white vigilantes um, over the last hundred years. And, and to me, it's just, again, just it just goes to show where the left's priorities lie. And their focus is always on history, or so they say. Um, it's always on history never on the present and definitely not on the future. Um, so it was sort of, it was par for the course. As I said, I didn't really see much new information in the piece. Um, it, at least that would have made it a little bit more interesting. But I think they are looking for any, anything they can find, regardless of how small, um, how few occurrences, you know, they're describing, anything that can, can continue to indict America as a systemically racist nation. Delano, I also think, though, when I, I read your piece, one of my takeaways were that this was this is being done intentionally to keep black people emotional, afraid, and it's a system, it's a, it's a tactic being used to control the actions of black people, and I analogize it to to the old KKK through fear, intimidation, the threat of violence, uh, the, the control of your emotions. It's a way of controlling your actions. And the Democratic Party started the KKK. It was a political, it was the enforcement arm of the Democratic Party uh, to scare off, to scare black and white voters for, from voting for Republicans. 
And I just see this as like the, the high tech extension of it in terms of they want black. And you acknowledged in the piece that some you went on a vacation where you had to drive through the South and maybe drive through Mississippi. Yeah. And the fear actually ran across your mind and you thought about it. I just think it's very unhealthy. Fear is not Jesus's friend. It's actually his enemy. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, your reaction to that? Uh, you're exactly right. So it's interesting because when I first sat down to, to write about this, uh, about the story, I was going to take an angle similar to what I've taken on the show before, which is, you know, look at the posts, pouring all these resources into these um, suspected eight lynchings. Why don't they cover, you know, the 7,000 plus black people who are killed um, in this country every year, which puts our homicide victimization rate at six to seven times that of, of white people. It's literally so high, you can't even graph them on the same graph. But then I started thinking about something different, which is it's not they're covering this at the expense of that. It's why they are covering this um, and why corporate media in general covers these types of stories. Now, I know that they will deny that that is their intention, but I'm talking about the impact and the impact, as you said, is to keep us, and us specifically, I mean black people, constantly afraid. Afraid that any white person we come across, and particularly in the Deep South, is out to get us, is out to kill us, is out to harm us. Um, that these people think our lives don't matter. And I, I just, I find that to be such a, a, a despicable way to do journalism, right? Because. Uh, fear is one of the most powerful emotions and, and, and afraid people are an easily controllable people. And one of the points that I make in the piece is that everybody has something to gain in this, uh, I call it the BTI, the black trauma industry. Um, the media, they get clicks and, and loyal supporters. Um, intellectuals get to sell books. K through 12 education establishment gets um, additional opportunities to indoctrinate our children. Um, corporations get customers. And the, the biggest benefactor, I think, are the politicians because they get votes. They, they sell people, and particularly um, black folk, on this notion that we are the ones, and Democratic politicians in particular, we are the ones that are going to protect your lives. We are going to end systemic racism. We are going to tear down white supremacy. And all those things are lies. They have no intention on doing those things because if they did, they, they, would, they would start by defunding Planned Parenthood, right? They, they, could, they could defund that. But they'll never do that. And, you know, I, I don't believe them when they speak. I don't have any expectation that they will love and care for my family more than I do. So th that they are less of the point. I'm more concerned about us. And one time I asked my friend this question and to, to sort of draw that link, you know, with, with abortion, I asked him, do you think black folks would would um, support abortion the way we do if it was Republicans who were pushing it? If every Republican politician, when laws came up that would limit abortion, says, no, we need these laws because without them, uh, you know, low income black women are not going to be able to, you know, have reproductive freedom or reproductive justice, which basically means they won't be able to um, uh, terminate their pregnancies and the black population will, you know, won't be able to, to keep stagnant at 13 percent of the American population. And he said, no. Uh, probably we wouldn't we wouldn't support it if Republicans were doing it. So I said, my response was, well, well how controlled is your mind, right? How, how what, what type of spell must you be under to continue to support a party whose one of their central core tenets is to keep your population as low as possible by specifically targeting our neighborhoods to put Planned Parenthoods in? Um, I don't think I ever got a good answer from that, and I don't think many Democrats can give you a good answer. But that that fear, I mean, you can see it. That it, it's led to more anxiety, in some cases, more neuroticism. Um, early in the pandemic, one guy wrote an op-ed for the uh, I want to say it was in the Boston Globe, where he said he's afraid to wear a mask in the store because as a black man, um, he knows he could be you know racially profiled and and potentially killed by the police. And I'm just like. Everybody's wearing a mask, dude. You know, this, you, you're not going to stand out. But when you've been conditioned to think that other people 
don't care for your lives and that they're targeting you, um, it, it, it's kind of expected that you would have that response. And as you said, um, I, I had the, those fleeting thoughts that came across my mind as we went, you know, we drove from D.C. to Texas and we passed through Mississippi. We stayed a night in Mississippi. We drove through Alabama. Um, but then I had to wake myself out of it and say, you know what, there's no reason for me to be afraid. And as you said, as a Christian, if if my fear of man is so great that it makes me diminish my love um, and affection for God, then then I'm doing this life completely backwards. Um, so I, I think th- these these types of stories, they always have their intended effect. And when you read the comments, you can see that. Right. It's always this country hasn't changed. The black man is always under attack. Why isn't the federal government um, doing anything about it? The, the local police force is probably in on it. So it's just us continuing to rehash the same narratives. Um, and, and when we continue to do the same things that we've always done, we should continue to we should expect to see the same results that we that we that we've always gotten. I'm going to read a passage from your column that I, th- I thought was brilliant. Uh, and you've covered it somewhat, but I, I just want to read it because I, I, it when I read it for the first time, I was like, wow, this is it. People who can't manage their money, running up credit cards and tapping payday lenders eventually become someone else's investment. In a similar fashion, the book of Proverbs says that people who lack the ability to manage their emotions are like a city that has been invaded and left without any defense systems. They eventually end up under someone else's control. And this is why I I keep trying to promote a conversation about, hey man, we can't be controlled by emotions. And this Hmm. whole uh, push of, oh, Anybody that holds in their emotions, they're not doing it right. They're actually weak. It's a sign of weakness. And you just got to let your emotions go. I'm not against expressing your emotions. But I think there's a time and a place for it. And so as a man, I think men should share their emotions with their immediate family. Wife, mama, kids, and that's about it. Putting your emotions on display over social media, every interaction you have with your boss or coworker, and you just got to let it out. And you just emotions are good and running and just quite frankly, running around acting like women. It's killing us. And. I, I just I read that and, and was like and I was like, man, this dude bringing this from the book of Proverbs. I knew I was right. These out of control emotions are undermining our success and ability to function properly in society. And we got to quit going for every little self-help book that, that just says, oh, my God, you're just so much better off. If you just let your emotions go freely, you're going to live longer. You'll be happier and blah, blah. And you know what? Some of those things may be true. Women are more emotional. Mm -hmm. They live longer than us. Hats off to them. They're not building these great societies that uh, we've had in the history of this planet. And so there's a role for everybody to play. And I just think men in particular and black men in really in particular, we need to control our emotions and quit letting people toy and play and manipulate our emotions. Absolutely. And, and uh, one of the things that I, that I really want to, to sort of tease out there is, is to show, and again, in Proverbs, it says that a, you know, a city without walls is, is vulnerable and, and vulnerable to attack. And for me, the issue is not just that as a, as a country and as a culture, people are way too emotional, right? Emotions have, as you said, emotions have their place. But when you do all of your process, when you process information purely through your emotions, you leave yourself vulnerable to someone else's, um, you know, emotional manipulation. It would be different if we saw righteous indignation coming from our community when, as I said, 
half the, 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 the babies in New York are aborted before they draw their first breath. If a Black Lives Matter organization sprung up and they planted themselves in front of the abortion clinics in um, Brooklyn and the Bronx and Harlem, and they chanted and they said, these are our kids, we wanna save them. If they, if they were providing resources to mothers and, and trying to um, help them make a different consideration, that would be one thing. If our national leaders, if LeBron James said, we're being hunted every day and we're the ones doing the hunting, black men, we need to step up for one another. We need to put the guns down. We need to stop the self-destruction. That would be one thing, but that's never what these people do. It's always uh, emotionalism, uh, oftentimes in, in advance of self-destruction because they have us to the point now where we will chase any story. It doesn't even matter how uh, minor the story is, right? You, you referenced you know, black newspapers you know, of yesteryear. And even though there may not be as many in print, there certainly are publications that cater to a black audience. And I'm thinking two that I've, I've written for before, actually, The Root and The Griot. And I know I can bet good money that if The Root and The Griot are running a story um, about something that happened to a black person, there's a 99.9% chance that the perpetrator is a white person. I, I just glanced at their Instagram today. I think the Greer was running a story about a white woman who was making a fuss because some black people had a flag that had Tigger, the, the character from Winnie the Pooh. I didn't even click on the story because I said, this is just more nonsense that they're pushing out. But but that's that's really what they do. Their, their entire... Um, existence is meant to inflame, um, it's meant to enrage, and, and really the effect of, as I said, we just become more and more emotional and less able to process information through our minds. Everything is coming through our hearts and through our feelings, and, and you see how easy it is. It's, it's so easy to manipulate us emotionally that in the 2016 election, the people were saying that the Russians were doing it because they know exactly how to get to us. They'll say there's some um, racial justice rally and somebody's going to be there counter protesting and they know that we'll react to it. And I want I'd like to see our community. And again, this is I'm talking as a futurist now. I'm not talking about what happened in 1864 or 1921 the way you know Ben Crum does. I would like to see our community get to, and all Americans for that matter, but specifically the black community get to the point where when we hear a particular story, when we hear a story like about the Colorado Rockies or some other thing, one, we do effective triage the way you, you do at a hospital, right? Some things you just get a Band-Aid, they send you home. Other things you have to wait in the waiting room a little bit for. And the most severe cases are the ones where you get seen immediately and you get the attention of the, the surgeons and, and you know, the, the specialized doctors and the specialized nurses. So some things we should just say, you know what, it's not even important, it's a non-story, let's get rid of it. Other things you say, okay, this is something that happened, but this may be a chronic condition. We may say racism is a chronic condition, that's fine, but that has to be managed. It'll never go away. As long as humans are here, um, differences between groups will never go away. And then other things we say, this is something that needs our immediate attention. The breakdown of the family needs our immediate attention. I don't care how much the government says that they love you, they cannot replace what you get when two people come together as one, they commit to themselves in front of God and family, and they say, we're going to um, nurture and support everything that comes from this union. There's no government that can replace that. The fact that that setup has been disintegrating in our community for the better part of 60 years now, and, and the fact that our leadership class refuses to address it um, is a, an indictment on how useless uh, the black elite have, come, have become in, in 2021. Delano, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll reconnect with you later in the week. Fantastic okay. job. Don't go anywhere. We got a worldwide premiere Uncle Jimmy's not here, but he left us a little uh, trinket, a little gift for our entertainment purposes uh, for today. You don't want to miss this video that Uncle Jimmy put together with my assistance. It's my obligation on how to 
Welcome back. When we first got to Nashville, Uncle Jimmy and I began working on a little project. Uh, we're both rap music fans. And so I wanted, I've always, I've put, well, actually I've put out several uh, rap videos, spoof videos over my career, but that was back in my Kansas City days. And so Uncle Jimmy and I wanted to do something special uh, to say, to announce to the world that we're back, bigger, badder, and better than ever. And so check out uh, our music video, Still Big J. Yeah, Negro, I'm still eating with you. Collard greens and giblet gravies run deep. Still Uncle Jimmy and Big Sexy in the house. Guess who's Guess back? Who's back, back, back. Though I've grown a lot, I still freak for the spots where big mamas rock the crock pots. The ladies pay homage, but the fast food joints say Big J fell off. How? When my last meal was from Sonic. I'm representing for the fearless all across the world. Grill. I'm in the drop thru and I love big girls. Grill. Taking my time to marinate my meats, and I still like my salads with croutons and beets. It's Big Sexy. Since the last time you heard from me, I kicked some friends. Well, me and Uncle Jimmy, we dipping McNuggets again. That's right, that's right. Laying back with a snack, play this track. Cal Herd trying to be the Burger King, but the Whopper is back. You back, back, back. Away. Big J is the name, and I'm still running the game. I'm representing for the fearless all across the world. Grill. I'm in the drop thru and I love big girls. Grill. Taking my time to marinate my meats, and I still like my salads. With croutons and beats, it's big sexy. Right back at you, coming at a buffet near you. 290 plus 320, add it up. Eat something with your dog. No sweats, no veggies, no smoothies, no skinny jigs. Just that big, thick, icky, icky. Oh, oh, wee. Suey, suey. Here you go, nephew. Come get some of this. Told you, I was meant to be a rapper. All right, that's it, and that's all for us today. My girl Tamara is about to come in your ear, tell you about that life we all want. We want to be, we want freedom. One of the greatest songs ever written, Freedom. Maybe now, maybe the second best song ever written after that video you just saw. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. Strike like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation. We all just wanna have freedom. Sitting on a corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving, all receiving. We all wanna be free. We want freedom.